Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss with Professor Ajaz Ahmed the developments that are taking place in the Iran-United States standoff. Ajaz, some developments, we don't know how to read this. One is that Trump is saying war is possible, but he doesn't want it. And discussions are open as long as Iran gives up nuclear weapons, which in any way does not have. And the second part is that A, Prime Minister A from Japan, has offered to mediate. Do you think these are signs that the European Union, having been more or less supine, that we now still have possibilities of mediation between the two? Or do you think that this is really just noises and it's not going to get any, go anywhere? Um, I think the business of Prime Minister Abe uh, mediating is, is pretty much a spectacle. Okay. Uh, and that is partly because it's not that the uh, EU is supine, but that it is cornered, it cannot defy the United States because of the sheer financial clout of the United States. But there is a fundamental disagreement between the two, which is not being expressed too much because there's nothing the EU can practically do. So it cannot play a mediating role for that reason, that it believes that Iran is uh, doing exactly everything that uh, it is supposed to do according to the, um, to the nuclear deal. And it is the United States that uh, is violating the deal. So that, be, that being the view that they cannot ask Iran now to give concessions, that, that being the view, they cannot mediate. Uh, Japan can sort of come to Iran and say, why don't you do this for them and why don't you do this for them. So this, this actually strikes me as respectful. This part. Do you think this is just basically Abe giving a cover that United States can negotiate provided Iran is willing and that is the more the substance of what Japan's intervention is? You know, these things are impossible to read fully. My speculation is that Japan warned the United States against the war. Okay. And Trump's come back to it was, all right, if you can do something about uh, mediation, you do uh, this. I don't want to go to war. If I have to, I will, etc. Uh, I think everybody is telling Trump. Uh, anybody who can talk to him directly is telling him this is disastrous. So Trump's come back is then why don't you mean it? I think it's that kind of thing. That there is no support for Trump's war from any side. Except his close advisors at the moment, Pompeo that, and Bolton. Better. Yeah, yeah, a number of, number of those advisors. And of um, course, Israel and Saudi Arabia as well. Israel and Saudi Arabia, the Israeli lobby inside, his financiers like Edison and so on. Not to speak, of course, of Pompeo and and, and all that, but it's a huge, big crowd breathing down his neck. Uh, his instinct, I think, is not to do it. But, uh, but he's so overcommitted to Saudi Arabia and his own son-in-law and this, that, and the other, that he's very trapped. Uh, and I believe, uh, again, this is very, there are some indications, some reports, but not extensive ones, that the Pentagon is involved. Pentagon is advising Trump to, you know, back off. Even at the time of the Iraq war, the chief of the general staff actually left three months after because the war was undertaken against his advice. Okay. And he didn't want to make the big show of resigning on that issue. But he left within a few months. But at the end of it, it is really Trump, isn't it, who decides whether the U.S. goes to war or it doesn't. It doesn't look like the Senate, the Congress has any role either. Yeah. And the Congress is not going to do anything uh, because the, uh, the House of Representatives is with the Democrats, uh, but the Senate is not. And warm-up making powers 
reside with the Senate constitutionally, although the Senate has ceded it to the President since 9-11. Uh, but the House, in any case, doesn't have any, you know, real war-making power. So any power related to war, that is with the Senate. And the Senate is the public. So as of date, really the call is going to be President Trump's, whichever way he goes. Yeah, yeah. If, if it is really the case that we are moving towards war and decisions to be made, uh, you know, this business of preparing for war seriously against Iran has been going on since at least 2005. So this still remains as a hot spot and a very serious issue for the globe because essentially it means the oil supplies coming through to Asia, through the Straits of Hormuz. It means the entire West Asian, shall we say, economy as well as oil is being disrupted. So it's a huge, it would be a huge blow to the world if any war really takes place. This would be a major, major global catastrophe. Unlike the Iraq war, we don't see any resistance anywhere in the world to the war coming, if there is a war. Uh, you know, the, the, the ability of the U.S. to use the world financial system against anybody and everybody, groups, corporate entities, individuals, etc., etc. We have always known latently that they have this capacity. But what has now come, um, I think, to the fore that everybody's it's staring everybody in the face under Trump now, that that is what they are doing, and they do have the power to do it. The world financial so system can be used against anybody. Yes, and they can do it to anybody and everybody. Okay. And China, Russia, Turkey, everybody is on notice. And they all know that they do not know how to bypass this. Maybe over the next 10 years or so, China, Russia, and so on will find a solution to it. But as of now, there's no solution. So people, any number of countries are making it quite clear that they extremely unhappy about it. China, Russia, Turkey, etc. Uh, but no one can step forward to defy me because the United States has taken the position that anybody who does will ruin the economy. And the global system, either international law or the world trading regime, the WTO, none of this is actually in a position to do anything. Yeah. Essentially, it's finance. It's and finance. And can't move if the U.S. Uh, puts sanctions in. When Okay. Um, so even Europeans cannot actually defy. And that is what is hitting everyone at home. So my sense is that over the next decade, for their own sake, not for the sake of Iran, but for their own sake, Europe, Russia, and China, collectively or separately, are going to try and protect themselves precisely against this. And the move towards having an alternative financial system movements of money um, will be undertaken by the series that can be such a structure. That's a very important point, Jaz, you're making, that you may have a United Nations structure which is supposedly dealing with, shall we say, external relations between countries. And there is a trading regime, the WTO, which supposedly deals with the global trade movements. But at the end of it, the financial system is entirely centralized with the dollar as a linchpin. And that allows the United States to bypass both these and impose its will on others through the financial system. Yeah, you see, the dollar is a, a, a global currency, but the depth of the institutions through which money moves, and the U.S. is kind of more on those institutions has now become so apparent in this case. When Europe actually wanted to carry on some trade with, with Iran, but just cannot. 
even then, minor companies who have no business with the United States is afraid to outgrow and be punished through the financial system. So no one dared do that. That's the clout that they have. That, that is what has come through in this case. They are using that economic financial institution, which has never been so clearly existed. And in some sense, this has been the quote unquote, shall we say, the nuclear option the US always had, but did not use. Yeah. It used sparingly, not yeah. that it did not yeah. use, yeah. it used sparingly. Yeah, yeah. And this is the financial power they always we, we all knew. But the, the most, most brutal fashion in which it is being used now against you know, competitors and allies in its own is the number that gets Germany and Japan. It's also interesting. Germany. It's also interesting. As long as there was a socialist bloc, this power really could not be exercised. It's only post it not be. It not be exercised. fully exercised. It could not be exercised, too. But it could be exercised to the uh, in the uh, you know capitalist world, but the point actually is in in, in, in addition to what you can see that <coughs> in the post Soviet period the financial system that is grown globally has become so much more intense very big globally and generally under US in, you know, the debt, the institutional debt now that the US commands is far And that's what is making the difference today when Trump chooses to exercise it openly. It has been exercised earlier, but not on the scale. Returning to another issue, we had this three Makkah summits that took place. Do you see this as any, anything new, or is it just the meeting of the, shall we say, the Arab uh, monarchies, in which now Qatar has been also accepted as an invitee? Saudis and Emiratis have done something that is historically unprecedented in the history of the Middle East. They have made an overt alliance not just a covert, but an overt alliance with Israel. And it all came out absolutely in the open in that voice. Poland. That came something in which you bring it in the minutes. So Saudis on the one hand are trying now to get both the other country and all the sustainability countries to they want to be seen as accepted by all of them. Um, and they can stay this and they will all come so. um, Now this is a this is a very major development in that uh, but the, what, what is also going on is the Saudis have been buying up country of the country. Uh, Israel, uh, I mean, Egypt, Sudan, Pakistan, they're, they're on, on, the, on the field, these countries. And they're good. So they can line up a fair lot of people. Uh, but other, it is, Saudis needed them so much for the legitimacy that they gave other this one chance to come and join them and so on. But we know that the Iranian towns are very different too. That Kuwait, Turkey, Iraq, and Qatar have now have, by their congregation, the greatest of number three of them there. And then there is Iraq, which has a relationship, a complete relationship with Iraq. So these are major countries. The, the only difference seems to have been the explicit and open use of Makkah for the political, shall we say, game of the South of the Southeast. This is something that has that has not been done till date. 
Yeah, it's absolutely bizarre. The you know, having this show in, in this supposedly holy city. So it's a sort of desecration of the city. But there's nothing substantial to it. We are relying on it. But do you think in this Jarrett Kushner statement that the Palestinians are really not full human beings because they cannot govern themselves and they need the Zionists to really govern them? Do you think all this makes any difference to at least the, shall we say, the Saudi monarchy alliance? Well, this is the first time in Americans. Okay. You know, uh, an American official has spoken about the Israelis. All the time. You know, uh, I mean, there are Israeli leaders, major, major leaders, on record, you know, referring to them as animals, as, you know, vermin, this, that, and the other, people like Lieberman. On record, you know, that If all of that is made, <laughs> except that is Trump's son in law. <laughs> As we have seen, just the destruction of Libya spilled over into uh, Europe. Yeah. But then, as far as Saudis are concerned, or the US is concerned, or even the Israelis are concerned, that's Europe's problem, not theirs. And that's been also the, shall we say, the strategic difference that has opened out. But as you pointed out, because of U.S. stranglehold on the financial system, the other powers today, unless they can build up alternatives, can't really buck what the United States wants to do. Right. So it still yeah. remains a global hegemon. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and now this, what has become very clear now is that, you know, all the pretenses have been dropped. What is what's important about Trump is that, uh, you know, he does not understand, he doesn't respect diplomacy. People around him, people like Bolton and so on, are, you know, on the one hand, they get paid by Mujahideen you know, The Iranian terrorist, terrorist organization, like, yeah, essentially. Yes. And, you know, uh, people like Bolton, who are on the one hand, doubt, on the other hand, so come from the power that they do is most powerful in the they, they cannot conduct diplomacy. So, world is in food. Now, Merkel and Macron both made sufficient trips to Washington to persuade the uh, Trump uh, to, to back off and give them some space. Okay, you can get me. Give us some space to be able to. Contemptuously dismiss. This is me. So, all the hypocrisy is off. What you have is yeah. just brutal yeah. real yeah. politics. Yeah. If I go by what you are saying, your analysis is for the short term, you are going to see a continuation of, shall we say, this kind of uh, blackmail, saber rattling military threats backed up by the financial clout of the United States. But the only solution would be not a short-term one, but a medium-term or a long-term one, if the other countries respond by building alternate financial channels through which they can operate. This is yeah. some total what you were saying. Right. And you see, the Chinese yuan and the Indian yuan are major currencies. So it is conceivable that over the next 10 years or so, you could see the emergence of an alternative, uh, you know, financial monetary, structure. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> which may not be equal to the American one, but independent. Which is which is what we have. We need what we need. I mean, the day the, the U.S. financial hegemony can be challenged, the game is over. For the United States. Yeah. Uh, it's not American military power that, that, in my view, really 
rules the world. It is the financial um, finance and I think what is called soft power uh, culture, uh, you know, um, Americanization of the globe. But uh, it's at the financial. Uh, and that, I hope, is what will come out of this dreadful uh, scenario that we are all going through. Thank you very much, Ajaz, for being with us and sharing your views about what is increasingly becoming apparent a very complex world, certainly more complex than we have taken it to be till now. Thank you so much, and we'll have you soon again.